Hello good people and welcome back into another Parry This History video. Today our topic is King Edmund I of England, otherwise known as Edmund the Magnificent. He is the fourth in our series of videos concerning the entire history of England as seen through the lens of the ruling king. If you have interest in those earlier videos, we have already covered King Alfred the Great, King Edward the Elder, and King Ethelstan. I will have a playlist linked in the description where you can check them all out. But let's just dive on in and learn all about King Edmund the Magnificent, the fourth king of England. Edmund was born in 921 AD, the eldest son of King Edward the Elder and his third wife, Eidgifu. This means that Edmund was the twelfth of Edward the Elder's fifteen children. Edmund was the half-brother of the previous king, Athelstan, who had ascended to the throne of Saxon England after the death of their father, Edward, in 924 AD. This makes Edmund I the grandson of Alfred the Great. Edmund would grow up essentially fatherless, as Edward the Elder would die in 924, when Edmund was only three three years old. After his father's death, Edmund would grow up at the court of his brother Ethelstan, raised primarily by his mother, Eidgifu. Ethelstan would likely serve as a father figure for his younger brother and saw to the education of both Edmund and his younger brother, Eadred. He would likely spend much of his adolescence at court with two prominent continental exiles, whom Ethelstan had fostered. The first of these is Louis IV, the future king of the West Franks, who was actually Edmund's nephew from an older half-sister of his, Eidgifu of Wessex, who had had married Charles the Simple. The other exile was Elaine, who would be the future Duke of Brittany. Ethelstan, who never married, would bring up his younger brothers almost as his own children, and cared for them as such. He would also show affection for the two exiles, and in many ways, they would come to know each other almost as family. These bonds would last throughout Edmund's life. The first notable event to include Edmund would happen in 937 at the Battle of Brunanburh, where Edmund would accompany his elder half-brother, King Ethelstan, into battle. This battle would see a large Saxon army comprised primarily of men from Wessex and Mercia, defeating an enemy army comprised of Scots, Norsemen from Ireland and York, and Britons from the Kingdom of Strathclyde. In this battle, Edmund would fight with distinction, which would earn him remembrance in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and begin to build his reputation as a warrior in the eyes of the English soldiery. In 939 AD, shortly before the death of Ethelstan, Edmund I would witness a royal charter as Regis Frater, or the king's brother. This charter is the only one from Ethelstan's reign which Edmund had attested, and it was likely meant to display the throne worthiness of Edmund and identify him as the heir of the childless Ethelstan. Ethelstan would die on October 27, 939 AD, and Edmund I would succeed him as king, and would be the first king to succeed to the throne of all England. His coronation would take place on Advent Sunday, December 1st, 939, at Kingston-upon-Thames. His ascension would be totally undisputed, and he would not experience the same struggle for acceptance as his elder brother had. However, within the first year as king, Edmund would face his first major challenge. After hearing of the death of Ethelstan and his replacement by an 18-year-old, Anlaf Guthfrithson, also known as Olaf, the king of Dublin, the same man who had led the enemy alliance at Brunanburh would seize York by the end of 939. Then, early in 940, Anlaf would lead an attack south into Mercia. He would march first to Northampton, where his army would actually be repelled by local forces. He would then turn and storm the ancient Mercian royal center at Tamworth. This battle would see great loss of life on both sides, but would see Anlaf victorious in the end. After sacking and looting Tamworth, Anlaf would turn to return to York, but would be intercepted by an English army under King Edmund at Leicester. A battle would not ensue as peace would be negotiated by Archbishop Wolfstan of York acting on behalf of Anlaf and the Archbishop of Canterbury acting for Edmund. This treaty would cede the five Danish boroughs of Mercia to Anlaf as part of the Kingdom of York, which he would hold with King Edmund as his overlord, to whom Anlaf would pay annual tribute. The five boroughs, of course, being Lincoln, Leicester, Nottingham, Stamford, and Derby. This set the border of the Kingdom of England and the Kingdom of York at Watling Street. This treaty would also establish each ruler as the other's heir, meaning the one who lived the longest would become king of all England. This treaty would be despised by the Danes of Mercia, who hated the Norsemen, and by this point viewed themselves as English citizens. Many of these Danes had since converted to Christianity and would suffer persecution under the Norse pagans. While this treaty may have seemed fairly bad for the English, it is important to note that while Anlaf was strong, he was rather old by this point, and Edmund, who was hale and healthy, was not yet twenty, so it seemed to be a safe bargain. Luckily for the West Saxon dynasty, Anlaf would not outlive Edmund, as he would die only a year later while raiding along the Scottish border in 941. Seizing the opportunity, King Edmund, upon hearing of Anlaf's death, would raise an army and immediately
immediately mount an attack against York in 942 AD. He would first retake the five boroughs of Mercia, aided by the inhabitants who despised Norse rule and remained loyal to the English crown. After securing Mercia and either killing or expelling all Norse lords and soldiers, Edmund would set his sights on the now leaderless Northumbria and the city of York. After Anlaf's death, another Norse ruler would rise up and proclaim himself the king of Jorvik, otherwise known as York. This man was Anlaf Sitrixen, the cousin of Anlaf Guthfrithson. Edmund would set out to recapture York, and on the way, in 942, would ally with King Hywel Da of South Wales and defeat King Idwal Fol of Gwynedd, who had allied with Anlaf and fought the English in Mercia the previous year. King Hywel Da would absorb Gwynedd into his kingdom and would then join King Edmund to attack York. Anlaf Citrixen would prove to be a less effective ruler than his deceased cousin, and would surrender to Edmund in 943 AD. Anlaf would then accept Christianity and would be baptized with Edmund serving as his godfather. At this time, he would maintain the city of York with Edmund as his king. However, his rule would prove to be weak and would cause trouble, so less than a year later, Anlaf would be expelled from York along with his men in 944 AD, and Edmund would regain control of York and would install English leadership there. Then, before the end of 944, Edmund would lead his English and Welsh army into the Britain kingdom of Strathclyde, where they would defeat King Donald MacDonald and his army. Here, King Edmund would demonstrate exceptional statecraft and would give the entirety of Strathclyde to the current Scottish king, Malcolm I. This grant was in exchange for an alliance between Scotland and England on both lands land and sea. This would set the northern boundary of England at Northumbria, and would end the antagonism for a time between England and Scotland. This alliance would establish a long-lasting power dynamic of Britain as Scots and English, as opposed to English and Norse. So in 944 AD, King Edmund I had re-established his rule over all of England, and had established new overlordship over the Welsh and the Scots, who were now stronger allies than ever. Through this campaign, Edmund had also finally eliminated Strathclyde as an anti antagonistic power and destroyed the Irish Norse power over York. Edmund would then spend the remainder of 944 and the entirety of 945 concerned with continental affairs. His nephew, Louis IV of West Francia, had been captured by his enemies and was being held captive by Hugh the Great, Duke of the Franks and Count of Paris. This was the same nephew who had grown up with Edmund at his brother's court, and therefore Edmund sought to take action to protect his nephew. In essence, King Edmund would write a strongly worded letter to Hugh asking him to release Louis IV and restore him to his lands, under threat of an English invasion to do so. So great was the power of England at this time, that Hugh the Great would immediately bend and release Louis IV from his captivity unharmed. King Edmund's reign would be cut tragically short the following year on May 26, 946 AD. On this day, Edmund had attended St. Augustine's Day Mass in Puckle Church, Gloucestershire. After Mass, he had attended a feast where he would be murdered by a convicted thief named Leofa. Some legends say that the king himself recognized recognized the man and tried to throw him out personally and was slain in the fight. Others say that Edmund attempted to intervene in a fight between the man and one of the king's stewards and was subsequently killed. However, most historians agree that this was likely a political assassination. Either way, Edmund died shortly after being stabbed here and Leofa would be immediately cut down by the king's guard. King Edmund would be buried at Glastonbury Abbey, which he had granted to Bishop Dunstan a few years prior. Edmund's eventful reign was less than seven years long when he died at the age of 25. King Edmund was married twice, first to Elgafu of Shaftesbury, later Saint Elgafu. The date of their wedding is unknown, but likely occurred at or before his coronation, as their second son was born in 943. With Elgafu, Edmund would have two sons, Eadwig and Edgar. Elgafu would die in 944, and Edmund would marry again, this time to Ethelfled, whom he would have no children with, and who would live on to die of old age in 991. Despite having two sons, King Edmund would be succeeded succeeded by his younger brother, Eadred, as his sons were only toddlers and therefore could not be king. When it comes to the impacts of Edmund's rule, the largest legacies are military, religious, and legislation. Administration, learning, and coinage remained largely unchanged under Edmund's rule, and continued on as they had under Ethelstan. As we have already discussed the significance of Edmund's military accomplishments, we will move on to religion. The English Benedictine monastic reform would in many ways begin under Edmund I. Despite not believing Benedict 
15 monasticism to be the only acceptable monastic life, Edmund's actions would perhaps inadvertently start this reform. Through support of prominent religious men such as Ada and Elfi, both of whom were Benedictine monks, and of course the appointment of Bishop Dunstan to Glastonbury Abbey, he would establish the dissemination of Benedictine doctrines throughout all of England. Regarding legislation, much can be said. Three complete law codes survive from Edmund's reign. These codes were appropriately named One Edmund, Two Edmund, and Three Edmund. One Edmund was focused with ecclesiastical matters and focused heavily on clerics. Uncelibate clerics were threatened with the loss of property and were forbidden to be buried in consecrated ground. This was intended to incentivize them to remain celibate to prevent church land being passed on to children. Another part of One Edmund emphasized the sanctity of the kingship by forbidding a convicted murderer from entering the same neighborhood as the king unless he had done penance for the crime. This law code would also contain laws against sorcery and idolatry, as well as condemning false witness and the use of magical or hallucinogenic drugs. Two Edmund was focused on public order and sought to promote peace and concord. This legal code focused almost entirely on blood feuds, which had become all too common in England since the Danish incursion. In simple terms, this code stated that in place of a blood feud, a weregeld, or financial compensation, should be paid by the killer to the family of the victim. If no weregeld was paid, the killer would have to bear the feud. However, Two Edmund forbids blood feud attacks in churches or royal manors. If the family of the killer abandons the killer and refuses to contribute to the weregeld or to protect the killer, they are then exempt from the feud and cannot legally be harmed by the family of the victim. This legal codification of blood feuds was a direct response to the large portion of English society which consisted of English Danes, who would prefer to pursue a blood feud rather than to accept financial compensation for the murder of a relative. This code would also encourage local initiative at preventing crime of all kinds. Finally, Three Edmund, otherwise known as the Coleton legislation, spelled out for the first time the feudalistic nature of the English kingship. This code required that all shall swear in the name of the Lord before whom that holy thing is holy, that they will be faithful to King Edmund, even as it behooves a man to be faithful to his Lord without any dispute or dissension, openly or in secret, favoring what he favors and discountenancing what he discountenances. This meant that kings, and also lords, were protectors of their people, in return for loyalty, patronage, and obedience. This law code also included laws governing the local authorities in cases of theft, in short, assigning responsibility for the investigation and apprehension of thieves to the local lords, and also assigning a price to be paid by anyone who refuses to assist in the apprehension of a thief. This price was 120 shillings to the king and 30 to the hundred. This document also defined the hundred as an administrative unit of local government. This term would in many ways replace the hideage system implemented by King Alfred the Great. The reign of King Edmund I would be short and yet still very important, eventful, and impactful. His law codes would survive and go on to inspire many more for years to come. His sons would both eventually become kings, and his military success would maintain the borders of England, which had been set by King Athelstan before him. He has many titles, including the Elder, the Magnificent, the Protector of Riches, and my favorite, the Deed Doer. Edmund was a man of action, and in every way he reigned as such. I fully believe... Had his life not been violently cut short, he likely would have gone on to become one of the most famous rulers to ever lead England.